Good Sunday morning to you. Welcome to the Sunday morning Bible study sponsored by The Morning Touch. The Morning Touch is brought to you by the Chaplaincy for the Homeless and the FSBC in Glendale. We certainly hope that you're ready to study with us this morning. All of those who are shut in and unable to attend church services, we provide this to you as a special measure of a study of God's Word, a special study designed just for you. And thank you for being a part of our study this morning. As usual, we're going to start out with a quick word of prayer, and then we'll get into our lesson, which is going to be part two. Last week, we talked about uh, the great King Herod and some of his motives and motivations for wanting to find the king. Today we're going to look from a different perspective and examine the three kings who came to King Herod. And we're going to learn some things from those kings that I believe that you can pocket and put in your spiritual toolbox that will help you in your everyday walk. I hope that it's a faith builder to you. And without further ado, we're going to go to God in prayer and then we'll get into our lesson. Let us pray. Merciful God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be on this side of life. Father, we pray as we study from the book of Matthew this morning about the Magi, the three kings, that you will help us understand what they did. And also, we will be able to apply it to our lives. Help us to evaluate ourselves that it may make us better servants, better Christians, better people. In Jesus name amen thank you let us turn to Matthew chapter 2 that's where we're going to spend our time Matthew chapter 2 last week we were in Matthew chapter 2 and we focused on Herod this week we're going to focus on the three kings let me start out with a song that you know very well no I'm not going to sing I told you weeks ago, I'm not singing. But this is something that you know about. And it's a well-known hymn that many churches and Christians and non-Christians alike sing. Listen with me. We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts we travel afar. Field and fountain, moor and mountains, following yonder star. O star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light of course that song is we three kings well known and sang widely throughout this nation and maybe the world during this time of year whether it's we three kings or silent night or oh come all ye faithful or the first noel they are all a part of the Christ christmas season but what we're going to focus on today involves the three kings in Matthew chapter 2 we learn that the three kings came from the far east to Jerusalem and in verse 2 we learn wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem saying where is he who has been born king of the Jews for we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him we are the kings from the east we saw his star of the king of the Jews and we've come to worship him now Herod of course feared that especially when the three kings showed up when the three kings left Herod the Bible tells us in verses 9 through 12 
After hearing the king, they went on their way. And there it was, the star. When they left Herod, they saw the star that they had seen in the east. It led them until they came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Beyond measure. Overjoyed beyond measure. Entering the house. The Bible tells us the king saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened the treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Those kings found Jesus following a star. Those kings traveled hundreds of miles across brutal desert temperatures following a star. Hot during the day, cool during the night, the threat of Haboob sandstorms, they weathered it all traveling hundreds upon hundreds of miles following a star that led them to the king of the Jews, baby Jesus. And it wasn't enough just to, to find the, the star or to follow the star and find the baby. They came with purpose. They came with a reason. The Bible tells us that they worshipped him. They fell down and they worshipped him. They honored him. They opened the treasure, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The question this morning is what do we know about these kings? What do we know? History unveils a lot and speaks to us about these kings. And we're going to tell you a little bit of history. We can't go in depth, but we'll tell you a little bit of history about these kings because it's very, very important that we understand who they were so that we can take a look at our own lives and evaluate and compare ourselves as it relates to their desire to fall down and worship baby Jesus, to fall down and recognize and acknowledge the King of the Jews, to fall down and worship and offer the best of the best to the one who came to this world to save people from their sins, Matthew 1, 21. What can we say and what do we know? Well, the biblical magi, which they're often called or referred to as, are the three wise kings or the wise men. In the Gospel of Matthew, and even in Christian tradition, history tells us that they were distinguished foreigners. They weren't just a, a caravan traveling through. They were learned men and distinguished men in their fields who visited Jesus after his birth. And when they came, they bore gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the holiday that we celebrate, the three kings are very much a part of it, because according to the Gospel of Matthew, the men found this divine child, and the Bible says this as well, by following the star, crossing the desert, traveling more than 12 days to Bethlehem. It's kind of amazing. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, history also tells us that these were Gentile men. They weren't Jews. They were identified by name in history. One is Melchior, who hailed from Persia. Gaspar, who hailed from India. And Balthazar, who hailed from Arabia. So, from foreign land and country, 
these kings traveled following a star shining in the east following a star that led them to baby Jesus now the question is how do they know this Jesus had been prophesied throughout Jewish literature and history the coming of the Messiah was something that was spoken about widely in Isaiah Jeremiah Ezekiel and certainly we need to understand that they had access to that information but Belteshazzar, Melchior, and Gaspar did not. They were of a totally different faith. They, they were Zoroasters. That was an early religion that started in the western part of Iran. And it dates back all the way back to the days of Darius the Great. So it was had a Gentile origin. It did not have a Jewish origin. It had a Gentile origin. These men were Gentiles. They were not Jews. The promises made to Abraham were not promises that were guaranteed to the Gentiles. That didn't happen until the gospel of Jesus Christ was open to all by his death, burial, and resurrection. But these ancient men who carried a very ancient religion with them had somewhat of a sense of truth had somewhat of a sense and knowledge of this god had somewhat of a sense or information about a coming messiah a king of the jews this was very very important to them it was important enough for these men to take out across the desert, drop what they're doing when the star appeared, grab the best of the best of what they had, to shove off on a journey, a journey filled with uncertainty, hidden danger, a journey where the promise was not even made to them. They were willing to risk it all because of the star they saw. The star was a strong message. Or the star sent a strong message to those individuals who were the roasters. It sent a strong message. They believed at this time that the stars and the heavens sent strong messages. And this bright shining star in the east was a symbol, was a message to them. And it signaled to them the need to travel to this star. Because somewhere in their history, somewhere deep, their God-man inside knew that there was something special about that child. Something special about this promise. Something special about the prophecy because you know one would ask why would these gentile wise men these gentile knowledgeables these gentile royalties why would they drop what they're doing pick up gold frankincense and myrrh some of the most expensive things in the middle east at that time why would they do that? These wise men who looked at the skies knew something. And it was placed on their hearts. And they were ready to hazard the desert. They were ready to take on the hidden dangers. They were ready to accept the challenges. They were ready to even face wicked Herod. At the threat of possibly being killed, they appeared in Jerusalem and they uttered the words, Where is the king of the Jews? 
They took that risk. All to follow a star in faith. And the Bible tells us that the star guided them to where Jesus was. And it camped right over where Jesus was in the manger. And when they got there, they didn't say, oh, we made it. The Bible tells us that these three Gentile kings, to whom no promise was given, these Gentile kings who had the knowledge that there was a king of the Jews coming, these Gentile kings immediately show great respect for the baby lying in a manger, Jesus. Great respect to honor him and to show how much being in his presence, in the presence of the very Son of God, in the presence of the very King of the Jews, in the presence of Jesus himself, the first thing these Gentile men did was to kneel before the child, to fall to their faces, fall on their knees, and to worship him. That's amazing. Gentile, heathen men who had somewhat of a God-man inside of them, recognizing the Son of God. They bowed down and they worshiped him. That this Son of God was even greater than their gods, greater than their Zoroaster faith. That this God, this Jesus, this Son of God, this King of the Jews was special. Special beyond measure. This is something that three Gentile kings and the entourage recognized. I don't know about you, but that is special and it's also miraculous. That some group of individuals from a heathen Gentile nation and an area in the east the Persia, India connection, Iranian connection. They're there acknowledging Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They're there respecting the one who has come from above, Emmanuel. That ought to not only bring tears to our eyes, but it ought to make us think. They offered him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the most expensive items that you could find in the Middle East at that time. They brought it to the very Son of God. You may say, why? I believe history bears out the Old Testament prophecy, even among the heathen nations. The Gentiles had some exposure to the Jews during various captivity periods. And I am sure that amongst the prophets, even during those captivity periods, we can assume that much of this was discussed. And some of it was remembered because the three kings came when Jesus was born and the star led them to the place where Jesus was. So there was across that history something sprinkled in the hearts of those Gentile nations that caused the three kings to come across the desert at the beckoning of the star. You know, they were evidently exposed to the fact that a new king would be born in the family of David. Most of them had been probably watching the heavens for years, looking for that star, waiting for that star. And then when those alignments happened and the star showed, it would foretell the birth of this king. And that would be enough for them to say, it's time. And to gather the gold, frankincense, and myrrh 
and to pull together the kind of faith they needed to cross an unforgiving desert in an unforgiving environment just to see Jesus Christ. I, I am totally overwhelmed with the idea that these Gentile men made that journey. Jesus meant that much. The King of the Jews meant that much. The one who brought salvation to the world meant that much to those kings to make that trip. To drop what they were doing. To shove off on that journey. You know, they must have been overwhelmed with the idea of knowing about the promise and then seeing that star. That had to just go pow and just say, let's do it. And they showed how thankful they were that when they safely arrived where the child was, they offered the greatest worship and respect that could be offered by a Gentile to a Jewish king. Think about it, falling on their knees before a Jewish king, falling on their knees and giving him gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the Jewish king. Think about that. The history between the Jews and the Gentiles in the Old Testament, it wasn't a love fest or a love affair. It was constant struggle, constant chaos, constant battle, constant war. But yet the history of the Jews was sprinkled among those Gentiles. And we see the result of the history being sprinkled among those Gentiles, that there was some respect and there was enough love and enough residual history to cause those kings to make that journey. That's amazing and it's miraculous. You see, what I like about the king's visit to Jesus is that we see here in this account, that true worship cannot be contained. If you love God, and if you desire to worship and serve and honor and respect Him, you will do what it takes. These men crossed an unforgiving desert, heat and cold, at the danger of thieves and robbery and death stood before Herod and proclaimed that they were there to see the king of the Jews, told the king that they were there to see the next king. That could have cost them their heads, but it didn't. They stood up in faith and they had such a zeal to do what is right that they did what it took. I love the fact that true worship and true desire to worship God cannot be contained. It will happen in the life and the heart of an individual who truly loves God and who truly wants a, a lasting, longing, prosperous relationship that develops day in and day out. The Magi, the King, show us that dedication and time for God is worth the effort. They show us that Jesus Christ is worth the sacrifice. That Jesus Christ is worth the journey. And that's the truth when you think about it. The Magi gives us insight as to how our own hearts should be. These were Gentile men who did not have a connection as it were, but they saw the real king of the Jews and they connected with God by worshiping him and honoring him and giving him their best right up front. There was no motive to go into business with Mary and Joseph. There was no motive, underlying motive to, to sponsor anything they did not have an ulterior motive except to worship God in spirit and in truth at that moment and I applaud them for that I applaud 
the Magi, the kings, for their attitude and their heart. They show us and give us insight as to how your heart and my heart ought to be when we approach the very throne of God, whether in prayer or worship. It ought to, we ought to be moved just like those Magi, moved to throw ourselves down on our knees, prostrate before the throne of God, ready to worship Him in spirit and in truth with the kind of fervor and enthusiasm and zeal of the Magi. You know, that, that, that begs the next question. <clears throat> you know, oftentimes, because we've had it so good in our time, we often take a lot of things for granted. When it comes down to worshiping God and giving God honor, the question is, do we worship with the kind of zeal and with the kind of enthusiasm and with the kind of desire and zealousness that the Magi had? That's a real good question that we can ask ourselves in evaluation because we take too much for granted. We take worship for granted. We take service to God for granted. We take his mercy for granted. We take his forgiveness for granted. And we take the mission for granted. There are things that you and I as children of God are supposed to be doing by way of service and outreach. We approach God's throne. We give our 10% or however, how much we give to the Lord's uh, church uh, for the work of the ministry and the support of the ministry. And a lot of times we think it stops there. Go back and stand in the mirror and ask yourself, am I taking worship, service, mercy, forgiveness, and the mission for granted. You know, the question we need to ask ourselves today is how charged are we about our faith? You know, they were charged up enough to saddle up on camels and ride across the desert following the star to see Jesus. Are you that excited about your faith? Or do you just go, oh, about Jesus? Do you go, oh, about the church? Or are you, oh, about your relationship with God? Many Christians are that way. Their faith, their worship, their relationship is just one big simple, oh. It's as though they are extremely bored and unhappy to be part of the kingdom of God. That's right, I said it. Many Christians act like they're bored and unhappy about their relationship with Jesus Christ. Shame on us. We don't have the enthusiasm and the zealousness and the love and desire of the Magi when it comes down to, to God. God has given us so much. He provides for us so much. He loves us so much. He sent Jesus so that we might have an opportunity to be saved, accepting his word. But yet many of us, we let our faith slide and the devil remove the word from our hearts. And all of a sudden it becomes, oh, so routine. Oh, so boring. Oh, so tiring. I want you to take a second look at the Magi because that's where our lesson lies today. The Magi love this truth. They crossed the desert on this truth. They followed the star based on their knowledge of God and this truth. They knew enough to know that the King of the Jews, Jesus Christ, was born in Bethlehem. And they followed the star. They didn't take it for granted. It was a, oh, they took it serious. How serious are you about your faith? How charged up are you about the birth of Jesus, his life, his example, his death, his resurrection? 
his ascension to become Lord of Lords and Kings of Kings. How excited are you about that? How excited are you about if you're faithful unto death, you'll receive that crown of life. The Magi were excited about just meeting Jesus. You have the promise in your hand, in your grasp. Jesus asked you to do but a few little things. And we treat him like, oh, so, so boring. Wake up. Wake up. Look at the Magi and learn the attitude that we need to have about our faith and our lives. How far do you go to fulfill God's word? How far would you go to worship him? Right now, COVID-19 is trying to shut churches, cut us off from one another. We have access through online services and other Bible study related uh, items. What are you doing to stay on top of your game? Do you love him enough to go to that online Bible study? To go to that online church service if you can't make it or your church is not meeting? Do you have enough zeal to take it upon yourself to do something to invite others or to add to your study, your daily study and daily prayer routines? What are you doing? How far are you willing to go? They travel 12 days across the hot desert and cold night desert under the risk and risk of danger and death because they wanted to see Jesus. How bad do you want to see Jesus? What does your faith mean to you? Are you willing to develop the kind of zeal and love that the three kings, the Magi had? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. What does it mean to you? How far are you willing to go to worship him? I know my grandfather used to tell a story about having to walk to school. And he said, you know, we had to walk eight miles up and eight miles back in rain, sleet, snow, and cold. We had to walk that far to school and back during the day, back in the day. My friends, they did that. And I asked my grandfather, I said, why did you do that? He said, well, because that was the only way we were going to get an education. My friends... When I think about what my grandfather told me about walking all those miles just to get an education, to go to school, and what that meant to him to be able to read and write and think, how much the more should it mean to you, even if you had to drive 50, 100, 200, 300, 1,200, 1,000, 1,500 miles to go to church? Would it mean something to you? It would if you want to submit and improve and develop that relationship with God. How far are you willing to go? What are you willing to do to fulfill that mission? The Magi taught us a great lesson about the attitude about our church life and our faith. We need to be improving our church life and our faith, whether it's online or whether we have to drive miles and miles and miles and miles and miles to meet or whether we start our own church where we are. Brothers and sisters, we need to turn it up. Turn up that intensity. Turn up that intensity. Because the Magi have got us beat when it comes to our to attitude, when it comes down to zeal, when it comes down to desire, when it comes down to fulfilling the mission, when it comes down to following the star. In this case, we follow Jesus, but when it comes down to following the mission and the message of Christ, the Magi have us beat. We need to improve. The Bible teaches us the Magi and what they did, their worship attitude, their idea, their desire. We need to have the same desire.